and welcome to Media Reporter. My name is Jennifer Yoon and we have a very special show for you today. Today we have with us Michael Vecchione. He's the Chief of the Rackets Division at the Kings County District Attorney's Office and he's also the co-author of the book The Inside Story of the Mafia Cops Case, Friends of the Family. Welcome, it's nice having you here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Mafia Cops case, it was essentially the worst scandal in NYPD history. These two cops, Luis Epolito and Stephen Caracapa, were working for the NYPD, but they were also working undercover for the Mafia. Um, it was because of their position at the NYPD that they had access to all kinds of confidential information, which they were ultimately giving to the mob, and the mob would use this information, and in turn, they would be killing um, their enemies and informants for the government. Um, it was also because of their uh, position with NYPD that they were essentially not able to be suspected of these crimes until two men, Tommy Dades and Michael Vecchione, um, essentially brought these men to serve life sentences in jail. So can you please tell me how this all began? Well, it began the way a lot of cases that have begun with Tommy and myself. Um, Tommy and I have worked together for a very long time, and um, he would bring me cases when he was a New York City detective working out in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and then with the intelligence division in the organized crime section. And uh, there would be cases that were generally years old, cold cases as we call them. And, um, and we were very successful in, in making sure that the bad guys in those cold cases went to jail, did the investigations, and then I did the trial, and, um, and we sent a lot of bad people away. So much like those cases, um, Tommy walked into my office one day and said, I think I've got a little piece of information about Caracapa and Epolito. And I knew exactly who he was talking about because you know, I've been in law enforcement for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And it was always talked about among people in law enforcement uh, that Epolito particularly um, was somehow mobbed up, as we say. And, um, the surprise to most people was that Caracapa, who was his partner off and on during the time he was on the police force, was involved as well. But we all knew that they had been, um, been suspected of being uh, somehow connected to the Mafia. And um, he came in, and particularly with regard to one homicide that they were involved with, um, said to me that he had gotten a new piece of information that he thought might push the investigation along and might allow us to not reopen, but open an investigation that had been um, long dormant. You know, dormant in the sense that for years people had talked about it but never done anything about it. And the piece of information was a phone call that he received from the mother of one of the victims in the case, a fellow by the name of Jimmy Heidel. Jimmy Heidel was a kind of wannabe, mm -hmm. a, a guy who hung around mob circles and um, was not a, a made man by any sort. But he was the kind of guy who was vicious and had a very bad temper and um, did a lot of things on behalf of the mob um, that he got paid for. Jimmy disappeared one afternoon, never to be seen again. And his mom always felt that um, he had been either kidnapped mm -hmm. or killed right on the spot wherever he was and um, it was an open case and had been an open case for a long time. Jimmy's mom, Betty Heidel, knew Tommy because her second son, Frankie Heidel, was also kind of a wannabe, a guy who had been hanging around the mob for a very long time and um, he had become an informant, however, mm -hmm. and he had been killed as well. So Jimmy was killed first, Frankie was killed second. It was the second homicide, the Frankie Heidel homicide, that put Tommy and, and the Heidel mom together. Okay. And, to, and Tommy solved the Frankie Heidel homicide, um, at least solved it to the point of knowing who did it, not necessarily enough to bring him to justice. But he became very close with Betty Heidel. And in a phone conversation, just as a result of um, Tommy calling her and asking her how she was doing, she said, you know, there's been something that I'd like to talk to you about that I hadn't told you in a very, very long time. In fact, I never told anybody, certainly not you, and it's been a long time is what I should have said. And um, it's about Jimmy 
Heidel. And she told him a story about how on the day of Jimmy's disappearance that her son Frankie was in Jimmy's car and that two detectives came by and grabbed him, pulled him out of the car and thinking he was Jimmy Heidel, rousted him, told him to come with us and then he finally talked his way out and said, I'm not Jimmy, I'm, I'm Frankie and they let him go. And He went back to his mom, told her the story. She went out in her car looking for these guys, wondering why they were looking for Jimmy. And um, she confronted the two of them. And they basically, you know, fluffed her off and said it's police business. And they were in a car that to her was a police car. Mm -hmm. It was an unmarked, you know, sedan at the time that was used by the cops. And, um, and she just kind of went home and, and let it go. Her son never came back. And she always remembered that day. And what put her, um, what put, it put it, what got in her mind um, that these people may have had something to do with the fact that her son disappeared was that she saw Louis Eppolito some years later on the mm -hmm. Sally Jesse Raphael talk show that was on in the mornings here in New York on a daily basis. And he had written a book called Mafia Cop about his career in the police department and, it's a, and the fact that his family was all mafia people and how the two things kind of meshed and, and in some cases didn't mesh. And he was promoting the book and she saw him. And she recognized them from the confrontation she had on the street in Staten Island, which is where she lived and where they were looking for Jimmy. And she bought the book. And she opened up the book to the section of pictures that was in there. And she saw the second cop, Caracappa. And she realized that she started to put two and two together and realized that there must be some connection between this and her son's death. She kept it quiet for a very long time, thinking that it was not important. But she did tell the FBI about it right then, but she kept it quiet from Tommy and, and, and everyone else. Um, the FBI did nothing about it. And when Tommy got that piece of information, he came to me and asked me if I thought that that was enough to open up an investigation into Jimmy Heidel's death. And when I heard it, I was very excited, and we began to, um, to work on it. And I put together a little task force. At that time, it was myself, Tommy, and our chief investigator, whose name is Joe Ponzi, mm -hmm. chief investigator at the DA's office, and we began to look at this case. And, um, and that's how we started. So you speak about Jimmy Heidel, and he was an interesting character in this book because there's a recurring theme throughout the book of the use of the NYPD badge, which essentially allowed these cops to get so close to the mafia because they would use their badge. Um, for instance, with the J Jimmy Heidel, um, they confronted him inside this unmarked cop car um, and supposedly took him away in handcuffs, which he would think would be a normal procedure for a cop. Right. And put them in, in, he was put inside the trunk of this car. Or That's in the back, correct. And he, he was murdered later on. Right. How do you feel about this use of the badge in able, like being able to get so close to the mafia? Well, members? obviously it's despicable. I mean, yeah. they use their, the trust that the public placed in them and the trust that um, comes along with that uniform and with that badge and betrayed the trust. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, I was familiar, I had done another case several years ago in which a uniform cop did the same thing. He wasn't in uniform, he was off duty, but he used his badge to get into a, a liquor store, saying that he needed to use the facilities. Mm -hmm. And um, the owner let him in, let him behind the plexiglass that was there to protect the owner because he was a cop. And once he got inside, he pulled his gun and he wound up holding up the liquor store, shot two people, killed one of them, um, and it was, a, uh, it was a horrendous case. And that person was then convicted. I convicted him and he was, he's doing 25 to life. Mm. The interesting part about it is that when he was arrested in our case, he was paraded out through the media as the cops are wont to do and a bunch of people watching TV saw it and they realized that he had held up a um, seafood restaurant in Manhattan. He held up all of the patrons in the restaurant and they all called in and said, that's the guy that held us up. He was arrested for that. He was tried here in Manhattan and he's doing, he's going to be in jail for the rest of his life. One little twist, the badge, the using of the badge, when I went out to the liquor store mm -hmm. to look at the scene and to prepare for the trial, I went out with some detectives from my office and of course when we got to the store to show who we were, we showed <laughs> our shields. 
well, you should have seen the look on the people's faces. They didn't want to have anything to do with us, and we had to kind of back out of the store, send someone in to talk them into letting us mm -hmm. come in and, and look around. So, so the badge thing was, it was, it was horrible. And, and you're right, Cara Cap and Epolito did pick up Jimmy Heidel as if he was going to be brought into a precinct. They handcuffed him, put him in the police car. Only after they took him to a, a location where he was transferred to the trunk mm -hmm. did they obviously, uh, did he probably get the idea, or I'm sure he got the idea at that point that he wasn't going to any police station, mm -hmm. and they put him in the trunk and then delivered him to the person who ultimately killed him. But that was, just, I mean, with Jimmy Heidel, he was delivered to another mafia member, um, yes. which was horrendous enough. But with Eddie Lino, can you speak to us more about Eddie Lino? Sure. Where they actually, um, in this case, they pulled him over as if it was, a, you know, a routine traffic stop. Yep. But they are the ones that physically pulled the trigger on him, and as they walked away, I mean, if you're driving by on the highway, you wouldn't think anything of a car pulling over, you know. Yes, absolutely. Well, one of the other murders that we ultimately uncovered as a result of beginning the investigation mm -hmm. with the Jimmy Heidel murder was murder of a mobster named Eddie Lino. And the connection, I should tell you that the connection between, there is a connection between Heidel and Lino, in that the person who killed Jimmy Heidel and who ordered the killing of Eddie Lino and who was paying Caracap and Epolito was a mobster in the Lucchese family named Gaspipe Casso. Mm -hmm. And Casso, several months before, had an attempt had on, uh, made on his life. And the hit team, so to speak, um, was made up of Jimmy Heidel, Eddie Lino, and two other people. So the murders of Heidel and Lino by Caracappa and Epolito, and I say murders because he's, they were charged with, mm -hmm. with both of them, even though they pulled the trigger only on one, um, or at the behest of Gaspipe because he wanted, obviously, revenge for the shooting of himself. So what they did with Lino was they knew that he had frequented certain social clubs in South Brooklyn on a particular evening, and they waited. And they waited along the Bell Parkway where they knew that he, would, um, he was going to ultimately get off at an exit where the social club um, was located. And they were in an unmarked car again. And I should tell you about the unmarked car, because the unmarked car was not a police car. Yeah. It looked like a police car. It was a car that Gas Pipe had given these guys to do this kind of thing, to make it look as if they're cops to make people uh, or fool people that they needed to fool um, to get them to pull over, just as they did with Lino. So they pull Lino over to the side of the road on the, um, I guess it's the uh, service road of the Bell Parkway in Brooklyn. And he obviously felt that he was being pulled over by cops, and in fact he was. He didn't know that they were bad cops. And they walked over to the car, and they used his cousin's name not Eddie. And he realized at that point, oh, you don't want me. You want someone else. And it was done, in my opinion, to kind of catch him off guard, to kind of let his guard down, which is what exactly happened. And one of them said something about what's on the floor of the car, and Eddie leaned over to see, and Caracappa took out his gun and shot him in the car. Um, shot him a couple of times, and then they, they walked away. There was, a, unfortunately for them, a witness there who had seen, witness. yeah, there was a witness. Not an, ident not an identifying witness, not someone who could see their face, but someone who was able to say that there, was, there were two people and that one was heavy and one was thin. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also found at the scene of the crime at that time a watch that had been broken and had fallen to the ground. We were never able to get any DNA off it um, to match it to what we believe is Caracappa. But there were people who said that he had a watch like that, and um, that was found at the scene. So these things became, uh, these, these murders, and the reason I'm able to speak about them now in terms of their completeness is because we had, obviously, we had an informant later on who told us the, the full story as to what happened. Since that time, since the investigation, since the trial, since the case has been closed, I have also had an opportunity to speak to Gas Pipe twice down in North Carolina where he's in a, he was in a federal facility and he's pretty much confirmed everything that we, uh, that we, we knew or and know. And Pipe actually spoke about this 10 years ago? Around he did. It. Actually, it turns out to be probably closer to 15 years ago now. About admitting that these cops had yeah. done this and they were on his payroll, actually. Correct. What happened is Gaspipe um, 
was a, he's a very, very bad guy. <laughs> Responsible probably for 35 mm -hmm. to 40 murders. Um, was called Lucifer by the federal prosecutors who were prosecuting him. And he felt that, and I think rightfully so, that his only chance of ever seeing the light of day again was to become a federal informant. Mm -hmm. And he did. He turned. And for months, federal prosecutors and investigators sat and took his story word for word about what he had done during the course of his career of crime. And uh, he told the whole story about Caracap and Eppolito. Um, it was never acted upon. No one knows why. I certainly don't know why. And, um, but all of the things that we later discovered through our investigation um, had been given to the federal authorities by gas pipe many, many years before. Um, and they lay dormant literally, literally for 10 years by the time we got the case. And we had to literally go over to the federal courthouse and uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, which is, I guess, not in the federal courthouse anymore. It's, it was in a separate office. And find those boxes. And they were literally covered with dust. And Tommy brought them over to us. Tommy Days brought them back to our office. And uh, we had to pour through them. And he did, did just that. So. And the breakthrough came with another homicide I should tell you about, um, which was the one that bothers me the most. And that's the innocent person killed by Caracap and Eppolito. Not necessarily with the trigger, but certainly with, his informa with their information. He was a guy named Nicky Guido. And he, a Nicky Guido was the third member of, third member of the four-man hit team that was going after, that went after Casso. So he had taken care of Heidel, had taken care of Eddie Lino. Nicky Guido needed to be taken care of as well. And he didn't know where Nicky Guido lived, had no idea where he lived and didn't have any sense as to where he would send any hit team to, gil to kill Nicky Guido. So, of course, he used the cops. Find Nicky Guido for me. And Caracapa, at the time, was in the um, Major K Squad, the organized crime section of the Major K Squad. He had, as you said at the beginning, um, a wealth of information at his fingertips. He had the police computer, most importantly. And the police computer um, was used by Caracapa to put in the name Nicky Guido. They figured his age was a, you know, they had a kind of a sense as to what his age was. And they had a sense as to where the area where he may have lived in South Brooklyn. Actually, downtown Brooklyn, mm -hmm. but on Carroll Gardens in that area. Turns out he didn't actually live in Carroll Gardens. He lived in what I call Windsor Terrace, but close enough, or Park Slope. And Caracapa found Nicky Guido, about the same age, address, the area was right, all everything was right, and he gave the information to Gas Pipe. Christmas Day, Christmas morning, um, Nicky Guido was taking his uncle out to see his brand new car. And as they were showing the car, an automobile came up the block, stopped next to the car, and they opened fire inside the kid's car. He was killed. His uncle, who he had been showing the car to, was shielded by Nicky, so he wasn't hurt, and they pulled away. Well, it turns out he was not the Nicky Guido who was part of the hit team. They killed the wrong guy. The real Nicky Guido, hearing about the death of a Nicky Guido in that area, mm -hmm. decided that discretion was the better part of valor. He decided to come in and become an informant for the police at that point. So he obviously protected himself. Um, and that one was the one that bothered all of us the most because this was a kid who was a hardworking kid, um, had a little disability as well. Um, and uh, certainly didn't need to meet his, uh, to die in the way that he did on Christmas morning in front of his entire family. So it was a, it was a horrible case. Um, at the end of this whole trial, the two cops still maintained their innocence. They claimed that they were good cops, they'd never done anything wrong. 
and they said that they were angry that they're being accused. How do you feel about the fact that after all this evidence against them, after all the suffering, they still claim to the public that they were completely innocent? Well, it's the height of arrogance, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, Eppolito showed his arrogance by writing that book in which he called himself Mafia Cop. Of course, it was you know irony, I guess, that he was using as the t you know in, in terms of coming up with that title. But he fooled a lot of people for a very very long time. Um, he fooled the entire police department for a long time. Um, he fooled people who were his friends, mm -hmm. people who were his colleagues, um, and I think my reaction is that it's just more of the same from him. He thinks that he can essentially just get over on people, just say what he wants to say, and uh, people are going to believe him. But, you know, when you have the, the evidence, the mountain of evidence mm -hmm. that was amassed against him, it's hard to put any credence into his story that he was, he was innocent. And um, but it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't really bother me at all because I would expect nothing other than that from, mm -hmm. from Eppolito. I mean, you were dealing with some pretty dangerous men. Um, at one point, your personal safety was also at issue. Your house actually got ransacked. Your car windows got beaten in. I mean, was there any point where you just kind of felt like, you know, enough is enough? And Honestly, no. Ever? No, not really. I never did. Um, I didn't even take that stuff very seriously. Everybody around me did, but I didn't bother me. The district attorney certainly did, the person I worked for. He had bodyguards on me for 24 hours a day for several months. They were living basically outside my house, living with me. Mm -hmm. um, we had, um, you know, the burglary was horrendous. And the reason that I never, I didn't give it a second thought at the time because I was so distraught over mm -hmm. the fact that my apartment was completely ransacked. And, um, but I lived at the time with my dad and he had his house downstairs and I lived upstairs. And uh, they broke into his place and got up to mine. Um, and when I went upstairs to see what my place was look, what it looked like, it was just, you know, it was horrendous. And I, I can recall breaking down in terms of just being emotional. I didn't, I couldn't, uh, I didn't know how to handle it. Um, I got over it pretty quickly and said, I have to do something about mm -hmm. this. Um, but when I went downstairs and looked at my father's place, it was hardly touched. That's good. Um, so people said to me, don't you think that there's something strange about this? And I, and I honestly, I have to tell you, I didn't really think that way. But I've kind of come around to thinking that now. And then it was when I went downstairs to our finished basement in the house that really kind of told me that somebody was sending me a message. What they had done was we had a bathroom downstairs in the finished basement. And they had taken the uh, commode and stuffed it with rolls of paper towels and toilet paper and then someone defecated into it and then they flushed it and the water with all the feces was all over our basement. They had to have the floor pulled up, the paneling pulled up and we had to redo the entire basement as a result of that. So, um, so that was, um, in, in retrospect, I realized that that was a message. It bothered me the second time that something happened and the second time something happened was I had come home from the gym very early in the morning. I left to go to the gym, came back, went into my house and showered and shaved, went outside to my car, which was an office car. And the back window of the car was completely shattered. And I looked up and down the street. I didn't see anybody else's car had been damaged at all. And um, again, thinking that, well, I don't know, I guess I was the unlucky one. And I got in the car and drove to the office gave the keys to our guys to fix the window. And a day or so later, I got a call from our deputy chief investigator, who I know very well, George Terra. Mm -hmm. And George said to me, um, I got to ask you a question. I said, go ahead, why? He said, um, he started to kind of hem and haw. And I said, George, ask me the question. What's the problem? He said, do you smoke? So I said, no, I don't smoke. Why? He said, no, I don't mean cigarettes. Do you smoke, you know, marijuana? I said, no, I, haven't, I don't. Why? He says, well, they were fixing the car. And where the window of the back, where the back window meets the um, interior of the car where they had to put the seal around it, in the ceiling of the car was a stash of marijuana. So I said, George, 
someone put it there. That's not mine. Really? And, uh, and, you know, I'm sure that it was put there for a, uh, for a reason. And once the DA heard that, I had the detectives back mm -hmm. with me again. This time, they put cameras outside the front of my house, the back of my house. I had the police, he had the police department come in and put this panic alarm in the house. Yes. And it was like one of those things where you're supposed to wear around your neck and you press it, you know. And, uh, and I said to the detective who put it in, I said, what happens if, you know, I press this button? He said, you only do it if you need it. I said, why? He said, because if you hit that button, he said, the world is going to show up. The precinct's going to show up. The borough's going to show up. Emergency service is going to show up. You're going to have, you know, everybody outside your house. So be very careful. Um, and, you know, I don't have any cats or dogs, so I wasn't afraid of them uh, setting it off. So it was, um, it was quite a time. And I had just started a relationship with, a, with a, an assistant DA, actually, in Manhattan. And, you know, I was kind of very cavalier about this. And uh, she was more worried about the whole situation than I was and thought I was taking it very much too lightly. So did it bother me? Um, I guess now, in retrospect, it does. But then I didn't really think about it. And it was in the midst of this investigation, plus several others that I was doing at the time into some crooked politicians and crooked judges. So um, who knows? We, the coincidence was too great for some people. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, this book is actually going to be made into a movie. This whole case is going to be made into a movie. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Um, the plan, the uh, screenwriter is a fellow named Terry Winter, who was the head writer for The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. So cool. he's familiar with the, the genre, so to speak. Um, the director is a, an Australian director named John Hillcoat, who has done um, a movie which is coming out in the I guess pretty soon, fall and early winter, called The Road, which is a um, movie based on a book by Cormac McCarthy, uh, starring Viggo Mortensen. So I'm very excited about the possibilities. I haven't done any casting yet. So, okay. well, um, one last question about the casting. If sure. you had to choose one Hollywood actor to play you in this movie, who would you choose? George Clooney. George Clooney. <laughs> yes. Why not? Shoot for the top. <laughs> all right. well, that's all the time we have right now, but it was very nice to have you here, and we thank you. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Yoon, and it was a pleasure having you. Thanks. Thank you.